Uh, in this presentation, I will not dwell too long on the past, but instead I will share with you the current shift in mindset that we are undergoing with our online development here at Massive. And by the end of this presentation, you'll understand how, by adopting a cloud-first mentality, you'll be better prepared than ever before for a smooth and stable launch of your game. But first, some background. And, uh, and who am I? Uh, and, uh, and what perspective do I bring to this presentation? Well, I've, I'm online focused. I've been at Massive for 15 years. And uh, the company itself is over 20 years old. And uh, since we can trace our online roots back 15 years, uh, we have this long legacy. And I, I just want to state for the record that I, I think legacy is, is a good thing because it enables us to, to rest assured on the quality of some subsystems so that we can focus on improving others rather than having to reinvent the entire way for every game we do. Uh, so let's take a look at a typical massive game. So uh, there's no spoilers here. There's uh, just Consider it a, a normal classic Massive game, whichever it is, running on your TV or console or PC. This game is connected to a uh, online infrastructure that uh, we run in, in data centers around the world. It uh, contains a lot of microservices, over 20, uh, that deal with things like your say gaming, your character and progression, and, and leaderboards, and, and, and what have you. Uh, and furthermore, this, your game is also connected to a game server. And this game server is running the AI, uh, it's running missions and uh, uh, controlling NPCs and, and of course also multiplayer activities. And then of course, this game server is also connected to the uh, online services uh, infrastructure. And uh, one thing that, that uh, this enables us to do is to, or, or that it forces us to do rather, is that we take care of the save game. Since the game state sits on the game server and not on the game client, uh, the, uh, the save game is synced between the game server and the R9 uh, backend. So with that out of the way, uh, let's talk a bit about what's cool about our online and the way we do this. And as you can understand, it enables us to run larger simulations because since the AI is offloaded to the server, we can, uh, we're, we're not limited by the compute power on the console or the client, but rather uh, limited by the compute power that we have access to in the cloud. This enables us to, to have a bit of a different performance budget than all the titles. Uh, mostly we focus this on, uh, on better graphics and, and, um, and better UIs. And, uh, uh, or higher budgets for, the, for this, uh, since there is less AI that needs to be computed on the client. And also, we have multiple clients connected to the same game server, so since they're already there, uh, it's easy for us to add seamless multiplayer, and, um, and it's up to, to us whether or not we enable flip a switch if we oversimplify it, so to replicate the players so you see them. This happens, for example, in the division when you walk into, uh, you can walk into a group of players and, uh, and that's because they're already, already there. So, now then, let's talk some consequences on, on our online strategy because, of course, there are choices uh, and there are pros and cons uh, with, with the way we build it. And, um, and these consequences are, well, to start with, it's a complex mesh of online services. Uh, you saw a, a very simplified picture of it uh, earlier. Uh, but it is quite complex, and there's a lot of interdependencies in there. Furthermore, since the AI is running on the server, uh, we cannot have an offline mode for the client. Uh, the client has to be always online. Otherwise, the game simply doesn't work. This means that the online stability is absolutely critical, even for single player. So we try to think of our online infrastructure as, as critical infrastructure. Um, and furthermore, since all the teams, uh, regardless of what you work with on pretty much in, in the, on the game, you're affected by online. So this means that, uh, that you need to, 
to be careful so you don't uh, break things uh, for other uh, other people. You know, if you break the game server, everyone, all the players on that game server are kicked out, for example, even from their single player session, which we don't want to happen. And we need to ensure that everyone uh, is up to speed on the latest on anti-sheet technology, etc. So here at Massive, then, we of course have all eyes on online. And to deal with this, we have a, a very efficient live ops organization here at Massive, um, who, who take online seriously and the quality of the service to, the, uh, to our gamers and, and, and adding, adding more stuff to, to the game as we go on. And, and we do lots of open betas, et cetera, for testing. Uh, for example, the, the beta on the division was the biggest ever for a new game. Um, that reached over 6.4 million players, which at the time was a record. Uh, but let's go back and, and talk a bit about development. And um, it's, it's a story of unintended consequences because since we've been doing this for so long, uh, and as time goes by, uh, different teams may start to use different testing methodologies, for example, and different technologies and that are best suited for their specific task at hand. And then also different tests uh, may use different stubs and shims. And different teams may test on different hardware. So there's a lot of special cases. And, and what, what can happen then is that special cases become the norm rather than the exception which increases an already complex system. It results in lots of isolated testing, which is not always relevant for the shipped game. And as we grow as an organization, fewer people understand the full online system. So let's talk about some, some examples of, of unintended consequences. Well, I mentioned the save game system uh, earlier. Uh, it's very important that it works, so we have built it uh, uh, to be rock solid. It's essentially a SAN. Uh, however, this SAN came online very late in the project, so a local stub had to be used in most cases during the years that the game was in development. And the team size is not large enough, um, because at the end of the uh, the latest project we did, a server could handle 1,000 uh, clients because of all the performance works that had gone into it. But we didn't have 1,000 members on the team, so on, on a playtest we couldn't actually fill a server. We had to rely on bots. And, and bots don't necessarily load the servers like players do, so it complicates capacity planning for launch. And some stubs and, and shims were, were tested more than the system and that we shipped. So we were not always focusing on testing what we actually shipped. So, so that was actually uh, very much something we wanted to improve. But furthermore, th this is more than a, a technological issue because for, for many developers, live is, is a special case. Uh, because it's not the case you see while, while you are working on the game. And we have different processes Therefore, it has evolved different processes uh, for when we develop the game. Uh, we have building data managers handling ops with QC monitoring. Um, but then when the game goes live, we have our live ops organization that I mentioned earlier with a war room for monitoring. So it's, it, it's quite different. And and of course, few developers actually see both sides of this fence. So it's hard to anticipate the needs of the, of the other disciplines. So we needed to be better at testing what we ship. And, um, and we, we have this mantra now that we test what we ship and we ship what we tested. And, and this sounds very easy. But, but really, it's, it's not. Because how often do you test the client? Well, you do pretty much every day, I'm sure. The services, um, your account systems, or any, any other thing you depend on. I hope you test it a lot. The game server, uh, I also hope you all test it a lot. Auto scaling, uh, how often do you actually test that? 
And do you also test scaling down, which you most likely need to do at night? Uh, do you test disaster recovery? Uh, or how often do you test that so you know it works? And furthermore, how often do you actually test the war room? So what, what happens here is that as, as, uh, as the, the impact on life increases, our ability to test decreases. So the less something, something is tested, the more it relies on a few experts with specialized knowledge. And these are people that uh, can get sick. Uh, so, so it's a potential liability and, uh, and a risk that, uh, that we don't want. And then, if you couple this with the way the industry is changing, the way it has been working for a long time, is uh, you spend a bunch of years in development making your game, then and you ship it and it's live for, for a while. And of course, as you all know, this is changing. Shorter time in production, longer time in life, uh, or in life, and um, ideally no end of life. So this new era, uh, where where AAA games are live longer than they were in development, is pretty interesting. Uh, it has a couple of consequences. Uh, for example, few developers stay on a project from the beginning to the end. Uh, simply because people have different interests. Some people want to build the foundations of games, some people want to maintain it, etc. And, uh, and what happens then is that processes, or what can happen, is that processes tend to be even more strict and formal to compensate the natural knowledge loss that you have. And we really want to break this chain of complexity. Uh, we want to focus our attention on one single unified workflow where we define processes in the most strict and formal way we know how and that is with code instead of with people. So if we take one workflow, uh, what we really do is that we start looking at the ideal live workflow and then we work backwards from there and, uh, and we try to apply that everywhere. And that means that we have a single code path for all features a single way of debugging your game, single way of monitoring your game, deploying your game, and testing your game. And this is all defined in code with automation by default. So let's talk a bit about this infrastructure as code. Uh, in practice, what we do is that we're using Terraform to script the complete infrastructure. And we're using Google Cloud Build to build virtual machines. And when we do this, uh, we needed to embrace infrastructure on demand, which was a big shift for us uh, since we relied completely on on on-prem uh, just a couple of years back. So start and discard is what we call the set of tools and principles that steer this attention to one workflow where you start complete live-like environments. You use them for whatever purpose you need, uh, and you can start how many you want. Every single team member can start their own complete live-like environment if they want to, and if they need that for testing. And then, of course, you discard it once you're done with it. So what do I mean, then, with a live-like environment? Well, it's actually it is a copy of the real infrastructure it is defined in code, so it's easy to copy it. It's easy to instantiate um, in, in the cloud. So you boot it up with the exact same auto-scaling rules, exact same firewall rules, etc., and the exact same way to deploy, debug, and monitor your system. As an example, uh, if a gameplay uh, programmer wants to add a dashboard to Grafana to monitor a, a gameplay feature, they would check in that feature and the dashboard at the same time in the code base. And then at every start and discard environment thereafter, they're able to monitor uh, in real time that specific uh, metric that they, want, that they wanted to track, regardless of if it's a playtest for a handful of people or uh, going live. So 
since this infrastructure then is sits in code, it's it can of course be branched and tracked together with with the code that, that uses it, and it means that we can have one hundred percent repeatable deployments, no special source on on any of these servers, no special cases, and everyone can go in and see uh, how it works if a developer wants to add a new service that uses a new firewall um, or a new TCP port, for example, or UDP port for, for that matter, um, you'd go into the infrastructure, open up the firewall for that port as needed, and check it in together with the code and have it submitted for review. Um, and it's all uh, it's all done by, by a single person. Can be. So, in order to to do this, as you understand by now, we need to have a cloud native mentality. And we use 100% Google Cloud uh, currently here at Massive. And, um, and, and I guess some of you will react with, oh, using 100% cloud of any type of cloud is very expensive. And, and yes, it can be, um, but typically it is if you move all of your on-prem and just boot it up up into the cloud. That's not exactly how we how we do it, which I'll cover later. Uh, because once we are inside Google Cloud, it makes sense to use some other on-demand services. Uh, and in one case, for example, we replace the subsystem that we have built ourselves um, with on-demand service on Google Cloud, and that saved ninety percent of the. Uh, operating costs for that particular system. Uh, and furthermore, since this particular system then, and any others like it, are on demand, there is no overhead cost of actually letting the entire team boot up their own complete live-like environment, because you don't pay until you actually use it. So that's a pretty nice, nice benefit. So uh, we we test what we ship and we ship what we test. Uh, one thing that we um, uh, that, that we did was that uh, we moved um, Say Games to to Google Cloud Storage. Uh, I mentioned or in the past we had we had the SAN, just made more sense to boot it in Google Cloud Storage and uh, and uh, and have it there. Uh, furthermore, we have smaller game servers so that we can fill them with human players at every single playtest. Uh, and then, of course, with uh, with uh, design and technology invent or inventions, we hide the fact from players that it's uh, smaller game servers. It's not necessarily something that you would notice, but um, but it means that we can have more relevant testing. Everything, every single time we do it. Furthermore, it has a lot of nicer benefits. It's easier and faster to scale down when you have fewer players to, to wait for to, that leave the server, etc. Every single playtest utilizes the same tech from deployment through monitoring and debugging as the live game does. And the process then, as I mentioned already, it evolves along with the code and and we can branch it, uh, which I find pretty cool. And knowledge transfer is improved. Because new hires, they can get the entire complete live experience in a safe environment. Uh, we can break stuff and have them um, have them troubleshoot it. Uh, or they can break stuff just exploring how, how stuff works. And then discard it if they want to start up a new one. We start, learn under proper live-like uh, uh, situations. So every playtest is then a, um, a dress rehearsal for being live and, uh, and sets the full path from build system, deployment, live monitoring, debugging. But, but we can also do some pretty creative testing that we were not able to do in the past. For example, we can simulate Australia. Uh, or rather, uh, we can simulate how it feels for Australian players. Normally, 
what you would do is that you add latency to the client and then you play test and you see how try to get an idea how it uh, feels to, to play the game in Australia. Uh, it's not really feasible to send devs um, across the globe just to test the game, so that's normally how you do it. But but a complex mesh of services all have different latencies, so it can actually be quite complex to simulate Australia in a proper way. And uh, and we can actually test better than that. So let's let's take a look on that. Here we have a classic setup, um, core services uh, or servers uh, in um, in Europe. And there's some third-party services in, in the US and game servers in Australia. And uh, and then the players are normally here in, in Australia. With start and discard, which we have defined in code, we can easily flip the table, put all the core servers in Australia and the game servers nearby our office, because then we get a true feeling for the Australian experience. And since this is sitting uh, completely inside Google Cloud, it's literally five minutes to change. So it's very easy to, to test this out. So, uh, yeah, so maybe I actually went uh, a bit ahead. Never mind the animations, that was that. And then, of course, we have the same dashboards available as we had before. And now we can see the effect uh, in these da dashboards on top of playing the game and feeling the ef effect. So, so hopefully the experience for Australians and, and, and others are improved. But there will still always be some special cases. Um, you saw the, uh, the third party uh, services that I mentioned in, in this example. Uh, we always have third-party dependencies uh, for, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, it may be, uh, for example, uh, telemetry or, or, or tracking. Uh, so the way we deal with this is that uh, where they have a dedicated staging and a dedicated prod environment, we have a, 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 proxies, a set of proxies that sit in between our start and discard environments and the internet, if you will, um, where we proxy the traffic through. And this means that all, all of our start and discard environments have the same view outside, even though we cannot control uh, the insides of the, of the third party uh, infrastructure. But it's still, it's a, it's a nice compromise and, and it goes to show that we really try to minimize the special cases in our infrastructure as much as possible. Uh, yeah. So, what would you do if you were to, uh, if you want to embrace start and discard? Well, you need to stay clear of special cases. Um, you should use a, a single code path and so on. But, but at a fundamental level. Uh, it's a shift in mentality that's supported by technology. Uh, it's not purely a technical solution. Um, cloud native and on demand is critical for the success of it. And uh, in order to, to be at a cost parity or cheaper than on-prem hosting. Um, but remember that if a programmer needs a special case for feature X, then you're probably doing it wrong. Um, there, hopefully, uh, you can find another way. You have a single code path. You do it the same way as when you're alive, and then stick with that. It's worth doing to not have to maintain multiple parallel code paths. Uh, and if you also plan to hand over to a live team uh, when you're done, uh, when, when you're shipping the game, then you're also probably doing it wrong, because as you see here, live is truly part of development. Um, yeah, we are we try to be live from day one of any new game. But but then what's what's 
maybe next in store or what's for you my challenge to you guys why stop here uh, because what you can do as a logical next step is that you can define all of the infrastructure in in code do you need a port opened um, you can do it yourself and submit the change for review. So in a way you could open source office IT. Uh, you could have lower um, upfront costs by using compute or lower costs when by using compute we're in where it happens to be cheapest at the moment. Anywhere around the globe there's uh, spot pricing etc that is uh, way cheaper than normal. Uh, and you may use that for, for your entire build pipeline, for example. Furthermore, uh, we all know that the Stadia works great for games, so of course uh, you would be able to stream your level editor. Uh, so you could have your workstation in the cloud and be able to upgrade it um, with new, um, more memory, etc. as you need. And working from home would then, or could then, be the norm rather than the exception. Uh, where you pretty much just need to fork the code in order to, to create a new dev team. But that would be what I call Game Studio 2.0, and uh, that is the subject for another talk than this one. That was my presentation about start and discard here at Ubisoft Massive. Thank you, and stay safe.